please join me in welcoming Kelly Taylor. Thank you. Well, it's really great to be here, and, and thanks so much to my, my colleagues at Regnery Eagle for uh, joining us today. Thanks for being here. Uh, yes, I'm from Laguna Beach, uh, California. I've been here about five weeks. Is it chilly in here, or is it just me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. The weather's been so mild. But no matter what the temperature was the past few weeks, whether it was 40 or 50, whatever it was, I was the one coming into work in the down parka <laughs> because I was always sure that by noon or 1, this thing that people keep talking about called snowmageddon would start. <laughs> so I've been trying to protect myself that way. And when human events called, I thought, oh, my gosh, they want a Californian because we know so much about structural budget deficits. That must be why they're asking me to come. I mean, we've gone years with a structural budget deficit, and the, the poor old Orange County registered week in, week out, talking about fiscal responsibility and prudence, and, and uh, California still doesn't get it. They are headed into this year with a $13.5 billion shortfall on a uh, $90 billion budget. I did say $13.5 billion, right? Yeah, $13.5 billion on $90 billion budget. It's a big problem. And truly, the national government is going in the same direction. And that's why, uh, that's one of the reasons I came here. Uh, because the whole thing, the whole train, we can see where it's going. Californians know where it's going. And it's just not, uh, not getting better. So the one thing I like about it here is people are thinking about these things. They're thinking about the history, about policy, about the role of government in our lives. They do things here, things are done here that affect Americans today and will affect us tomorrow and how we are going to carry our principles forward. What happens here is important. Sometimes too much of it happens. Sometimes the boundaries of government's role are forgotten. And sometimes we have to be reminded of how powerful the nation's founding principles are and how important it is to defend them. I'll tell a story from Orange County, a story from here at Human Events. R.C. Hoyles was the founder of uh, Freedom Communications, which founded the Orange County Register. Probably his signal position throughout his tenure as publisher was when he was the only publisher in the nation to oppose the internment of Japanese Americans in camps during World War II. He didn't do it after World War II. He didn't do it 20 years later. He did it in 1942, as soon as the executive order from Franklin Roosevelt came out. He argued that it was unconstitutional, and he also argued it on a, a human basis, that he Japanese Americans had thrived in Orange County since the turn of uh, the century. They were farmers. Many, many were farmers. Uh, they lived uh, in Orange County and were very productive, and he found it hard to believe that these people were uh, conspiring to overturn the government. And he did this at a, a time he wasn't in the Midwest. He was along the coast, and there really were warships off the coast. And there were dirigibles housed in Orange County used to scout the coast. So where, and we hear these arguments today, balancing national security versus individual liberty, and you see it in whether it's SOPA and the piracy, uh, whether you see it with the er discussions about Iran, and you have to think very carefully about the individual liberties that are at stake versus the national security that we seek uh, to obtain by taking away those individual liberties. You really have to think through those close calls. More, maybe to me, more, almost more important, I mean, his position about the internment really didn't change the course of America. But what he did after World War II really did change people's lives. When the Japanese Americans returned to Orange County uh, after World War II, and some of them had fought in US forces, they came to find that their homes were taken over. Their farms were taken over. Their possessions were taken over. Now, R.C. Hoyles, as publisher of the paper, he could have been silent. He could have turned the other way because it was very unlikely that the Japanese Americans, in part because of their culture and in part because fear of further reprisal, very unlikely they would have objected uh, or raised a cry about people sitting on their land. They told me this. R.C. Hoyles, in the front pages of his paper and on his editorial pages, 
made the principled argument that this was their property. They owned it. The trespassers had to give it up. And to this day, in Orange County, I have met the children of the families that still own the homes that R.C. Hoyles won back for them after World War II. That is the power of a principal. That is the courage of a publisher that can understand the values and make the case. And that's what goes on here in Washington every day. Those are the arguments we make, the arguments we try and understand what the highest values are. And I think that's what we need more of today. And fortunately, I think we're hearing it more and more in, in the debates. It's why I came to Human Events. Human Events was founded in 1944 very much to understand the Cold War and to fight against it, but to understand its scope and parameters in the United States. And uh, they carried that flag uh, for a long time. Um, so that was number one, that they defined it. And uh, the editor-in-chief today, he's been there 50 years, Tom Winter and Alan Riskin, who is still one of our advisors. Uh, but they probably, uh, one of their big peaks was when President Reagan and Ronald Reagan started to read them. And in 1979, Human Events reprinted a speech by Jack Kemp which basically made the case that cutting taxes would produce greater prosperity. And President Reagan, and they reprinted the entire long speech by Jack Kemp, it was 1979. Reagan read it, began a collaboration with Jack Kemp that would last all through the 80s and became the basis of our whole, of the Tax Recovery Act of 1981 and our whole uh, approach to the economy. Uh, through the 1980s. And of course, human events was in the middle of the uh, reducing the mutually assured destruction uh, approach for nuclear weapons. And uh, Reagan used it as his uh, watchword touchstone during the uh, negotiations with Mikhail Gorbachev in Iceland. Of course, that didn't go so well, but you just keep marching forward. Uh, as Winston Churchill said, if you're going through hell, you just keep going. So he just kept, kept marching forward, and, uh, and that had, of course, a, a better outcome for the Soviet Union and for the world. So uh, the most unpopular stand that human events took was in 1972, George Wallace was the candidate, and Tom Winter told me that uh, they opposed George Wallace, and the, the party was absolutely flummoxed. They couldn't believe human events uh, would oppose this popular George Wallace that they thought they actually had a chance in, but for a variety of reasons, including his economic populism, Tom Winter and Alan Riskin said no, and uh, of course had broad influence on that election. They went with Richard Nixon. So... Those examples all speak to the idea that those are the moments when you need to know your values, political and personal. You need to understand how to apply them, what's the higher value among the competing values, how to make the really close calls. You need to have thought about the appropriate role of government in your life and in society. You need to have thought about America's constitution and the difference between negative and positive rights. You need to have thought about where individual rights in America come from. As Mitt Romney said last night, they do not come from government. And as you travel around the world, or if you have traveled around the world, you will hear this from people. We don't understand how you, everyone in America just has rights. Don't get caught that the idea that government is the power in your life that can give you something and take it away. You already have it. It's the government's role to defend it. And that's what we have to keep reminding our friends across the aisle. It is a natural right. So we think about those things as human events. We think they're important. But when we're not 30,000 feet up thinking the big thoughts, we're right here on the ground and we're working. So uh, as I do for my 13 nieces and nephews and grandnieces and nephews, uh, I have a few words of advice. Uh, when we have interns at human <coughs> events or at the register, we call them the lesson of the week. So I'll combine <clears throat> four weeks into four lessons, four lessons of the workplace. Number one, in your relationships, grant sincerity first. You may know people who say things to you like, 
You have to earn my trust. Well, you know, that's a person that has a giant mental scorecard that you don't know what's on it. And usually it's a person that spends a lot of time thinking about their giant mental scorecard when it comes to each person they meet. You know what's a lot easier? Grant sincerity to your colleagues first. Grant sincerity. And if someone is kind of clever and going to cut corners or do things for their own self-aggrandizement, that'll show up pretty quickly. Just keep an eye out for it, but in the meantime, grant sincerity. Uh, Treat people like you'll be working with them for a long time, because if you've chosen a good company, you will be working with them for a long time. And it is uh, kind of like a family relationship. You want to be able to bend and give and take, and with the idea in mind that we're going to be working together a long time. Walk away from third-party conversations. If you're sitting in a room with somebody else and they start to talk about someone else, excuse yourself. If you have an issue with someone and maybe it involves one or two people, just make sure everybody's in the room. Make sure you talk to that person first. Just avoid third-party conversations. Uh, Maybe a corollary to that is if your boss's boss asks you for a conversation, make sure your boss is in the room too. Nine times out of ten, it's something you all three need to talk about anyway. And you can avoid a lot of landmines by uh, doing that. Just politely say, let's bring my boss in on that. Uh, Finally, resist being clever at work. Being clever is taking a shortcut. You know why Wendy's hamburgers are square? The founder of Wendy's didn't want anybody to take shortcuts to make them round. He said, we'll we'll give them a full burger, and it's going to be square. So don't take shortcuts. Don't do things that just make yourself look good. Be conscientious. That's the number one thing to be at work. Uh, Follow through. Be true to your word. Do what you say you're going to do. Because at the end of the day, especially in Washington, where we see so many cases uh, of people changing the truth, changing whatever it is, for your own self, your word is who you are. So before you make agreements, before you say what you're going to do, be sure you're solid on the agreement and stick to it. So those are my four lessons for the uh, intern lesson of the week. And uh, number one is be solid on your principles. So I am so happy to be involved with this organization and to be welcomed here to Washington and talk with you all today. Thank you very much. If you would uh, wait for the mic, uh, Kathy, I'll let you call on people. Oh, if you just okay. give your name again. I got um, a question. Good. First um, I know that you, you did your um, graduate work at Claremont, and it was at the Peter Drucker School. I don't know that it was called Peter Drucker School at the time. But I know that you, you got to meet him and that you, I guess, studied with him as well. Um, and for those who don't know him, if you could explain who he was and what was kind of the best advice you got from him, and what do you think he would say about how government is being run now? He was a fabulous management guru, um, incredibly principled. What advice uh, would he have? Would he have today for what in the heck is going on? Right. Well, if you don't know Peter Drucker, uh, he's called the father of modern management. If you only follow one business person's book, uh, read by Peter Drucker. It will help you as a manager. It will help you as an employee. And then he has this other really big, fat book called Management, Tasks, and Responsibilities. And it was written in the 60s, so you kind of have to overlook the he, 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 he part. But it's, and the way you use it is you just look back in the index to something like if you need advice on finance, structure, and then you look it up that way. You don't read it front to back. Uh, He was delightful. He was Austrian. He's very important, I think, for women to know because he was the first dean of uh, a business school that uh, accepted women into their MBA program. Now, Harvard will say they did in the 1950s, but uh, I will stick up for Peter Drucker. Harvard had a cross thing going with Radcliffe, and that's what they call their admitting women into their MBA program. Uh, But Peter Drucker at New York University admitted uh, people, women into NYU. Uh, so to me, he's uh, a hero. He values people as an individual. His words about politics uh, was more in defining the role of politics 
and I, he didn't, in the classes, and I took tons of classes with him, he didn't really comment on uh, what was going on. He did define that the role of the political leader is to define what is relevant in society, uh, move people toward a solution, and help them understand what that is. And I think that what we, if we apply that to what we've seen in the last four years, we have seen none of that with President Obama, absolutely none of it. Uh, you could define health care as an issue for our time, but you would never do a cram down the way he did. And the destructive part of that is that when he did a cram down, business on this end has to plan. And business now, uh, the health care industry, is now planning as if Obamacare is in place. And so, in a way, it's like a false market. They are moving down that path. And you see the lobbyists all over. This is what CQ and roll call, this is what they're all reporting about. The business just cares what the regulations are going to be at this point. So we need to stay firm on repeal, but it's going to be harder and harder with every day that passes. So if you are in a bookstore, pick up Peter Drucker. It's the best you can do for yourself and your career. Okay, long answer. Next, shorter. Welcome to Washington. Delighted Thank to you. have you. Delighted to have you at the helm over there at Human Events. Uh, my name is Becky Norton Dunlop. I work here at Heritage. And I'm just curious as to how you and when you think the impact of what's going on in California will show itself to visitors and to the uh, nation writ large. Because right now, it just appears like Old Man River just keeps rolling along. I'm, I'm puzzled at where the outrage is because what is happening in California, and I'll use one example with a, uh, something that the Register had been writing about since early 2000, public pensions. My theory is that the left couldn't get prevailing wage, which was a ridiculous idea. Why don't we all just make 100000 a year and end it? Um, they couldn't get prevailing wage, but what they could do was work on the public employee pensions and do what they could there. And post 9-11, there was a great heartfelt sense that uh, public safety officers, firefighters, let's take good care of them. And I hate to say it, but that morphed into these, uh, particularly for public safety officers, a pension structure that is... Uh, commonly 3% at 50. And this translates into, picture this, you've worked somewhere 30 years, and I was almost 30 years at the register. I could retire, if I'd been a public safety officer, with 90% of my highest salary my last year. And, and anybody in HR understands all this sort of the gimmicks you can do. You can add in your overtime to spike your salary. You can add in vacation time. You can have a, a, a disability bump in your last year if you can prove your back went out. So police officers, after 30 years of work, which may put them right at about 50 years old, uh, a good age, by the way, um, they're suddenly earning, if they put in overtime, over $100,000 a year in retirement. And uh, similarly, for firefighters. Now, you could kind of argue, argue that public safety workers, it is harder to find police officers, fewer applicants. Firefighters, there are thousands of people who want to be firefighters, and they're fairly easy to find. So <coughs> the public employee pension problem that sent the city of Viejo, California, into bankruptcy and San Diego, California, nearly into bankruptcy and now is happening in other parts of the country eating up city budgets, I think this will be the thing where people go, why are my services declining? Why is my city not able to fill the potholes and do what it's, take care of the infrastructure? And as they see the budget taken up with 30, 40, 50 percent to pay current public employee pensions, that's where the money is going. That's the only thing I can see. I can't believe it's gone this long without more outrage. I really can't believe it. So, but I think that will be one thing that uh, gets the attention. Do you see more bankruptcies so they can just get rid of these pension plans well, and get more reasonable? In California, the unions fought for a law 
uh, and I don't know the status of it at this moment, that would preclude cities from being able to go bankrupt. So it's one more way that, that citizens are kind of shielded from what the truth is. They're not bankrupt, but they have no money, which is California's, def- our state can't, can't go bankrupt uh, according to the Constitution, but de facto, what do you call it when you owe year after year uh, so much more than you're taking in? Yes, sir. Excuse me. Um, Jerry Lipson is the uh, deputy for the city committee and the former. Uh, sorry, sorry. Jerry Lipson was the uh, deputy for the city committee and a former worker who in the new office. And I'm just a kind of a personal question. As an editorial writer um, in the news business on the conservative side, you were you were part of a pretty lonely crowd. Most of the newspapers tend to know, left of it. And, and I'm wondering, uh, given that were you always a conservative, did you grow up that way, or was there an epiphany at some point where you suddenly realized that, you know, America was not flat after all? And it brought you to having the, the register, say, as opposed to the Los Angeles Times or, or, or the Oregonian or, you know. Oh, the, Yeah. It is. Well, the thing about newspaper editorial pages is that they, the current trend is to reflect the values of the community. Now, this is very much a marketing position. Oh, if we reflect all the values in the community, we will never tick anybody off. And, you know, so newspapers have kind of lost that ability to be thought leaders and to be the people kind of thinking things through. And at one point I heard uh, that, uh, and I well, that at USA Today, they actually voted on their positions. Can you imagine? I mean, positions come from thinking them through and applying values and, and really trying to work out um, the hard questions of life. Uh, but I came to it um, from the capitalistic side. I'd been a, a business writer for 15 years, and I really understood what entrepreneurism and what opportunity was in Orange County, which is just a fabulous place to be a business reporter. Now, we had a lot of fraud, too, and I covered that. But I knew people who started businesses that, um, well, for my birthday every year, I would pick somebody to interview that I really was interested in talking to. Uh, Not that I told them that, but that was kind of like my gift to myself. And I interviewed um, a fellow named Arnold Schopi, and you will see his invention in almost every bathroom in America. You look behind your toilet tank, and you will find a thing that it's a woven cable that goes from the top to the bottom. And that's what he figured out how to do. And you know how he figured out how to do it? He bought shoelace uh, making machines from Massachusetts because they were going out of the shoelace business. He brought them to Orange County and started weaving this flexible tube pipe um, with thin metal on the shoelace, modified shoelace making equipment. And you know, Fabulous things. Could the government have even thought to do that? You know, and I know we just see these stories of, in defense of the defense budget about how many inventions come out of, you know, the military. And yes, they do a lot of research, but I don't know. And then they were claiming credit for the internet, too. <laughs> and I've seen the technology industry itself grew up way outside of government, way outside of government. You got to let people go. You got to. Let them take all their crazy ideas and their risks and just see what they can do. That's how I came to libertarian conservatism at the register. Anything else? Uh, yes. And You know, it's a lot easier to point out where Obama is so far afield. The conservatives, I think last night, 
even my mother who's visiting and she's 85, she was really getting on Ron Paul's bandwagon by the end there. She was saying, hey, you know, I finally get him. He doesn't sound so crazy tonight. Um, And I think this is the gap where Romney has the hardest time because I think the people I know that, you know, just sort of, well, we're all, we're, we're working girls and, uh, and people, working people, and you just go, I'm trying to run my household budget this way. I'm not understanding how we can run all these deficits. Uh, I'm not understanding why we're not taking steps to rein it all in. And that's why Romney has a little bit harder time of it because he sort of always has a cash balance. He always has that thing, you know, he can reach for a little more. Um, And that's the the great, that's what people are puzzled over. And uh, to me, that's what's going to carry when we get to November. It's going to be this huge number of people, and I don't know whether this is wishful thinking, but I just get this feeling out there that the psychology of the election will be, we're going in the wrong direction, and especially the independents who voted for Barack last time. He went too far left. I thought he was a bright guy. I was willing to give him a chance. But you know what? It didn't work out. And I just think there's going to be a massive turnout in November, a massive turnout, and that people will just, especially the independents, will just say, I don't know who the Republicans put up. He has his flaws. But we just got to turn this around. We got to start running this country the way we, in the rest of the country, have been running our own lives and trying to make it through the recession and doing everything we can to get through for ourselves and our families. And the country's not doing that, and they got to get back on track. So I don't know whether that's kind of the way I see it going. Sure. That's a very good question, and I think the Republican Party of Orange County has done a very important thing. Uh, one of the things, of course, was the, is the immigration issue. Uh, and the GOP of Orange County just a few weeks ago came up with a plan that um, kind of sounded like Mitt Romney last night, but it kind of took care – Focus took care of all the parts of the immigration question and didn't just come out with that, you know, sort of send everybody home kind of thing. It was layered. It had a uh, guest worker in it. It wasn't Dream Act. It, it didn't go that far. But it was a more nuanced approach than just um, we don't like it, we're going to get rid of it, and we're going to, well, in like Alabama, we're going to turn ourselves into a nation of enforcers and spies. You know, when you turn – and I know I go apart from Dana Rohrabacher on this, uh, when you turn hospital workers, teachers, business owners into spies and enforcers, you turn America into something that's different. So I think the GOP in Orange County has come up with a, a good program um, that the rest of the country can learn from. Uh Tell us a little bit about what your goals are for human events and oh. uh, how the, it, we can get it to more uh, intelligent, young uh, women and middle-aged women and actually the guys, too. Great. Hey, thanks for all your really great questions. I appreciate it. And this is a, a wonderful question because we do have a whole new strategy going at human events. Uh, this is a great uh, brand if you want to look at it that way. I mean, you have no idea how many people in Orange County when I – talk to them about, and I talked to a lot of people about human events and what it meant, what it stood for, should I go there, and everybody, their eyes would just light up. It was like, oh my gosh, I grew up with that. You mean you could go and be at human events? Oh, you've got to do that. That's wonderful. And and our main markets are California, Texas, and Florida. Uh, We circulate about maybe 40,000 now in the print edition. But we do have a new strategy uh, cooking not only to enlarge what we do nationwide in print, but also to go more deeply into the Hill 
and boost our circulation greatly by about 20-25% uh, right here in Washington. And I'm working on a prototype right now that will it will be literally a larger paper. It will have uh, new, different departments. Uh, we'll have more reporters. Uh, I am talking to people now, if you are a, a journalist. Um, and so we'll take care of that on the print edition. The online edition is incredible. It already has an audience, a big national audience, which is much different than, say, you take somebody local like the Washington Times. They have a great local audience. But we have our national audience from human events, um, hundreds of thousands of people every day. And uh, then we have redstate.com, and Eric Erickson was just named the nation's number one uh, political blogger, but I think it was Hollywood Reporter. People take, you know, Hollywood Reporter, sounds good. So, uh, we, and we're working on a redesign of the website, something that's more, even more flexible. And we're involved very much with CPAC. I think Human Events was a, a founder of CPAC. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we w and Red State Gathering, we're just laying the plans for that in August. It'll be in Jacksonville, Florida. And I'm also on the hook for another event. If you have ideas for June, we want to do a local June event. So uh, both in print, online, big changes coming, already underway. I don't know whether you've noticed our primary coverage. We now have um, uh, ad tracker, delegate tracker, uh, financial uh, uh, campaign information, and, of course, uh, results, uh, live results of all the primaries online, too. We just added that uh, for New Hampshire and are rolling out more of that uh, for Saturday night. So... The whole plan is to get bigger and better and have more influence everywhere and especially among young people. It's a great message, and we're going to work very hard to uh, expand it. Yes, sir. Can I follow up on just that? Um, what plans have you for expanding the circulation? What plans do you have about expanding circulation on college campuses? Right. Well, we will be at CPAC. That's for sure, and that actually is, uh, we have people right now, um, this is uh, one of the intern jobs, they are identifying uh, key conservative groups at key campuses around America. So we are, number one, we're going to find out who they are. Then two, we're going to make contact with their leaders. Three, we're going to get their email lists, and then we're going to start that reader engagement thing going. That's the plan. As my older brother says, make the plan, work the plan. Make the plan work at, for everybody who has older brothers. Thank you so Great. much, Kathy. Thank you. Okay.